you're syncing up and tuning in to the Lending Link Podcast, powered by GDS Link, where the modern day lender can dive deeper into the future of data, decisioning, and credit risk solutions. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm your host, Rich Altman, and today we're syncing up with Frank McKenna, Chief Fraud Strategist and Co-Founder of Point Predictive, a San Diego-based fraud solutions provider which powers a new level of lending confidence and speed through artificial intelligence, a powerful data consortium, and decades of risk management expertise. Its data and technology solutions quickly and accurately identify truthful and untruthful disclosures on loan applications. With over 30 years of experience working in various fraud detection, mitigation, and management roles, Frank is a leading authority of all things fraud. He works with lenders to launch solutions that incorporate predictive analytics so they can solve their business problems with greater accuracy. Frank has worked with more than 100 banks, lenders, and companies throughout the world designing strategies, solutions, and operational practices that help them reduce costs and increase efficiencies. In 2016, Frank started his blog, Frank on Fraud, to give a fraud fighter perspective on the global rise in fraud. Frank is also a board member of The Noble, whose mission is to protect the vulnerable, including victims of human trafficking, child exploitation, scams, and elder abuse. Frank holds his MBA from Cal State Easy Bay College of Business and Economics and his undergraduate degree from St. Mary's College of California. In this episode, Frank and I will touch on many facets of fraud, including fraud trends, unique types of fraud, some solutions in the market, and so much more. But before we dive into the interview, please head over to our LinkedIn and Twitter pages at GDS Link, that's G-D-S-L-I-N-K, and hit those like and follow buttons. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to your podcast. All right now, let's get synced with GDS Link. Welcome, Frank. I hope you had a great weekend. Thanks for joining me today. Where are you joining us from? Hi, Rich. It's great to be here. I'm joining you from beautiful San Diego, California. We're normally 75 degrees here, but we're about 60 and looks like it might rain today, but still glad to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Well, thanks so much for joining. You co-founded Point Predictive in November 2013. Uh, Can you take a little time to share more on your background and what you were doing before starting Point Predictive? Oh, yeah, of course. And thanks for that very nice introduction. If I think about my career in fraud, it goes back to right after I graduated from college. I started in banking. So I worked for banks here in California, Providian National Bank and Wells Fargo, where I managed their credit card and debit card strategies. In 1997, I made the leap into technology. So there's a company here in San Diego called HNC Software at the time that had machine learning technology called Falcon that was really taken off at the time. So I joined that company and really started to get into fraud consulting, where I worked with a lot of different banks, card issuers, lenders on helping them understand how to fight fraud. In 2004, I made the leap from what then became FICO because they acquired that company, HNC Software, and I became an entrepreneur, establishing a fraud company called Basepoint Analytics, where we tackled mortgage fraud, a company called CoreLogic, who you might be familiar with. They bought that company and that's when we started Point Predictive. We wanted to find new ways to help auto lenders, in particular, to fight fraud. Well, you and I are actually alumni. I worked when I worked for Teletrack. We had been acquired by CoreLogic. We have that in common. Also, you know, you mentioned HNC Falcon. It's you know, I dealt with Larry Spellhog back in the early oh, '90s, is... and it's funny to me sometimes when AI and machine learning became popular again over the last couple of years, I'm sitting there saying, wait a minute, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) this has been around for a long time. So it's it's, uh, not as new as we all think it is. They say it was the first commercially successful application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the world. So it's a, it was an amazing company to be part of. And you know, like you met, meet so many great people that had their roots there and lucky I was one of them. Well, it's interesting. I can remember when I first was dealing with HNC at the company I was working for, that's when they were looking at how they could use neural nets, not only in fraud detection at the point of sale, but actually in lending. So that was something they were discussing back in the early 90s. So here we are many, many (laughs) years later. So thanks for sharing your background. You know, that's one of the things I like to do before I dive in is just ask some personal questions. And I had the opportunity to uh, visit your, your other blog, which is called Frankie Photo where you go out and take pictures. And I like your motto, uh, take a walk, bring a camera and find something beautiful. Of course, today, everyone has a camera with them, wherever they go with their phone. uh, They've gotten more and more sophisticated in what they're capable of doing. It's really amazing. 
So, you know, what was the driver behind starting that blog? Is it something that you find time you can keep up to date? And a real big challenge here is to help the audience visualize what you would say is one of your most memorable pictures that you ever took. I think if I go back, it was 2011. I just gotten a really nice camera. We just sold our company, CoreLogic, and I wanted a project. I said, I want to learn how to do photography. And so the blog, blogging about it, it gave me a purpose and a reason to go out, take a walk, find something nice and take a picture of it. So I started that in 2011. I didn't want to just create photos, but I wanted to create photos and have and tell the story behind it. So I started right. a blog. It helped me motivate me to get out there, give me a purpose around photography. And I did that for you know five or six years. And my photography really excelled. And I had a lot of people reading that blog. I stopped in 2016 for two reasons. One was because I had a son and he was born that year and I just mm -hmm. didn't have the time. <laughs> but I also wanted to focus my blogging on my career. So I started right. Frank on Fraud. So I kind of just shifted from photography into fraud, <laughs> which are my two loves, I would still say. If I was to describe a memorable picture, it would have been in Vietnam. I was in a small village in Vietnam. It was about two in the afternoon. It got really hot and then just started torrential downpour. I walked outside with my camera and I was just going to take a picture of the rain. And just when I got outside, there were these three girls that were all sharing a single bike. So they were all kind of sitting on the seat, driving down in this torrential rain. And I took to take a picture of them and they were all laughing and the rain was pouring down. And it was just this visual of like life in another yeah. country. and. It was just a beautiful moment and I still have that picture and I have it framed because it just reminded me of just how awesome life is. And that was a picture of something so simple and, yeah. and carefree. And today life seems so complicated and yeah. challenging. Here in the US, especially in Vietnam, it's still like that though. Yeah. Very simple life. And that's one of the reasons why I like traveling internationally is to get that perspective. Well, I'll hope to have the opportunity to uh, visit there someday. Let's put away our phone cameras and take a look at the ever-excelling rating world of fraud. So Frank, with more than 30 years involved with fraud detection and prevention, you've witnessed quite an evolution in fraud schemes. I remember when I ran the fraud department at Bank of Boston back in 1985, we would send our fraud analysts out to uh, seminars where they would learn on how to detect the way fraudsters would fill out applications. And they slanted their their letters a certain way, and they dotted their eyes a certain way. So here are things that are now far more sophisticated than that. So when you think about fraud trends, what are some of the things that you've really found the most interesting in actually some of the schemes that are out there? Yeah, interesting that you say, you talk about that application fraud monitoring, because I think I went through those same courses and I learned, you know, I got my start looking for a lot of those same things. My first job was actually looking for dots at the end of signatures that were indicative of Nigerian fraud rings. It was just a different time. It was a lot simpler then, yeah. but some of those things are so interesting. So if I think about the top three trends that really stand out in my mind, I really think of things that were turning points in the industry that led to big changes. So three examples I would guess I would give is the first was the stolen mail theft at airports in 1991. It's right when I first got into, into fraud management and in Houston, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia, the thieves were stealing trays of credit cards out of the mail, and they were using those cards. At the time, in 1991, there was no such thing as card activation. It was, you get a card in the mail, you go to store, and you use that card. Wow. And there was no stickers on those cards to call in and activate it. But the fact that fraud rapidly rose because of that mail theft, they adopted that technology they called CRV, card activation value putting the stickers on the card, and it led to fundamental change in the way that we protect our cards in the mail, those stickers and that activation process. That'd be the first thing I think that stood out in my mind. The second would be the rise in counterfeit skimming in 1995. And I don't know if you remember this, but in 1995, the fraudsters figured out how to install overlay machines on top mm -hmm. of these credit card readers yep. and start skimming the data. And they were able to just you know, think about the antiquated technology of a magnetic stripe. It, all the data is there in the clear. You can take that off, that data off with the skimmer, and then just plug it into a new card. And that just caused counterfeit to go crazy. Not yeah. only here in the U.S., but across the world. That fraud, that rise in counterfeit skimming, led to sweeping changes and the adoption of chip and pin. Mm -hmm. So 
that stood out to me as well because that was something that was cost America and every other country in the world a lot of money, but yeah. it was enormously successful. That would be the second thing. And I think the third thing that stood on my mind was the mortgage crisis of 2004, 2005, when fraud was running rampant with these liar loans, with the straw borrowers, with just every type of mortgage fraud you could think of, that fraud crisis led to sweeping changes in mortgage, right? Its mortgage process is much different than it was in 2005, 2006. It's much safer. Those three trends to me were really turning points for the industry that have had long-standing, I'd say good consequences overall, but those are the things that stood out to me. With the years of experience I've been in the industry, everything you say is totally relatable. Funny today, you you, you know, you use the word "take one." You say to the person, "Take one application." I'm like, you know, what what is that? <laughs> right? Oh, well, yeah. something that would sit on top of a cigarette machine in a retail st- at the uh, bar yeah. to apply right. for a Visa or Mastercard. You'd fill out your name, address, social, date of birth, and it would be like a postcard. And there wouldn't even be an envelope. You just send that back through the mail <laughs> with all your PII. Yep. And the banks didn't even think about it at the time. So, Incredible. Yeah, pretty, pretty funny. You know, point predictive, when you guys first started the company, you really were heavily focused in the auto space. So maybe you could share a little background on how point predictive evolved and why was it auto? And you mentioned mortgage. And why did you start in the auto space? When we sold Base Point, we wanted to find a greenfield opportunity that nobody else at all was involved in. So we actually started the company with no set agenda other than finding that opportunity and filling that opportunity. So we did research. We talked to banks, we talked to lenders, and we said, where do you need help? And we pretty quickly figured out that auto lending was a huge gaping hole for risk. There were no consortiums. There was no use of AI or machine learning. Lenders were not communicating with each other about fraud, and they were suffering the consequences. Dealers were committing fraud. And once they get shut down at one lender, they go to another lender. Mm-hmm. And they could run these fraud schemes for six, seven, eight years without suffering any consequences because they could just go to the next easy target. So we said, hey, we've got experience in machine learning. We got experience in consortiums. The auto lending industry is in kind of desperate need of something. And by the way, this is a huge part of our GDP. 3% of the US GDP is on auto sales. So for something to be unprotected like that told us there was a big opportunity. So we decided with conviction to go after auto lending and kind of take all the learnings we had from other industries to help lenders solve the problem. Yeah, it's interesting. I was reading in the paper yesterday, our local paper, a local dealership actually had a 100,000 plus car driven off a lot by a fraudster. It hit home because I was reading the paper right after I had finished up writing my uh, notes for today's podcast. So Frank, you mentioned straw man fraud. And I think it's a term that seems to be somewhat unique to the auto industry. Can you explain what it is? What is straw man fraud? You mentioned it earlier. Yeah. So straw man fraud, it's a, it's an interesting name. You know, straw man is like a scarecrow, right? It's a, right. something that you put in the field and it's, it's not a real person. It looks like a real person. Straw man fraud is designed to look like a real person or a real borrower to a lender. It's very common to have this type of fraud for mortgage lending and auto lending where somebody goes into the dealership that is not intending to drive that car, own that car like a real person. They're either going to be a front where they're going to go into an auto dealership, say the car is for them, but it's actually for somebody across the country that they are they have good credit, so they're going to stand in and then turn the car over to that person. So mm-hmm. they're like a straw buyer of the car. Now, there's lots of reasons that people would do straw borrower fraud. One is to help somebody that they know get a car who has bad credit. The second is a little more insidious. They might be doing it for for fraud perpetrators who want to take those cars and ship them overseas. So they're using these third-party people they'll pay. You know, straw man can make anywhere between $500 to $1,000 by buying the car and turning it over to one of these fraud rings. Mm -hmm. And they can do that over and over again. So they can use their good credit to get these cars. We think it's about a a billion-dollar-a-year problem just in auto. So you're looking at a multi-billion-dollar industry just around having people purport to have a loan for them when it's actually for somebody else. It sounds similar to where people will sell their good trade lines, right? And let yes. somebody piggyback on their credit report, become an authorized user. It's a topic we t- touched on yeah. a couple months back. In fact, I think it's when we were interviewing Tom Algie, who recently joined you guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think that was one of the topics. So yeah, real interesting. But yeah, it was funny to read this article. It's like, hey, that's exactly what Frank uh, was talking about the other day. I had somebody last week who got a job offer who'd read my blog on straw borrowers. And he reached out to me, said, should I take this job? 
the job was really interesting. It was working for this company that was going to pay him $500. They were going to have him go online, buy cars, and flip the cars to them right after. They were going to pay mm. him $500. He didn't know what he was getting himself into. I just strongly recommended that he <laughs> reconsider because he was probably going to be engaged in some fraud that he didn't know about. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad he reached out. <laughs> the fact that he was reaching out in, in a loan would have been the answer for himself, right? So when we think about different types of consumer loan products, such as credit cards, unsecured personal loans, and auto loans, mentioned mortgage, can you kind of highlight what you see as some of the differences that lenders face in, with each of those different products? We just mentioned straw man issues. And then more like, what are the similarities? We kind of almost have drew a Venn diagram of all the different yeah. products and where they overlap and where they're they're different. I've gotten this before. So I think if we, I've been involved in trying to help lenders and banks stop each of those types of frauds you mentioned. So from my perspective, there are differences. And, and the differences are kind of four things. The first thing would be the data they collect. So when you apply for a personal loan, you're going to provide a little bit different data than if you're going to get an auto loan or a mortgage, right? A mortgage is going to ask you for a lot more, auto loan a little bit more, and a personal loan, maybe just your name, address, phone, and your income and your employment. So what the lender asks for, that's different. So the data that lenders collect is different. The rates of fraud are also quite different, right? If you look at a, a credit card fraud rate, it might run, you know, seven basis points, mm -hmm. where an auto fraud rate might run 50 basis points. So you're going to have these different levels of risk that associated with each of the types of right. fraud. And the process to approve, right? When you get a credit card, it's instantaneous. When you get a mortgage, it's 90 days. It's, so you have a lot more time that might lapse between when you're actually submitting an application and actually having it fund. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the last thing would be the different types of fraud. You know, credit card fraud is very transactional. Yep. Most of the fraud occurs after the loan has been originated. You know, counterfeiting, lost, stolen, non-receipt, all of those types of fraud that happen after origination. A auto lending fraud is going to be, you're going to lose your money right up front because it's not transactional. It's right at the time when they get that car. So the different types of fraud that you're going to experience are also different, but there's a lot of similarities too. If you think about the similarities, I'd say they're more they're more alike than they are different, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think okay. you're always going to have ID theft, whether it's an auto loan, mortgage loan, credit card loan, personal loan, you're always going to have identity thieves trying to get access. You're always going to have an element of synthetic identity with fake profiles. You're always going to have an element of people lying about their income because income is core to understanding if you can afford that loan. And you're always going to have some element of employment fraud. And you're always going to have some element of exploiters, people that are first party fraudsters that are not stealing identities, but they're getting those loans, those credit cards, those auto loans, those mortgages with the express intent of defrauding you. They're first party fraudsters. All those span each of those types of channels and they all need to be accounted for. One of the things I've always wondered is, when consumers had a limit on their exposure on a credit card, you know, really to that $50 fraud, you know, you were a victim of fraud. Did it make consumers maybe a little lazy, in your opinion, in, you know, really checking every single transaction on my credit card? And I always wondered whether the lenders should actually implement like a point program for consumers if they actually help identify rapidly mm. fraud that's on their right. card. I went through uh, seven cards with one provider in a year oh. where I was buying my you know my airline ticket and I was amazed at the things that they didn't catch where I was flying at the exact same time as someone else who had used my card who had a totally different name and he was going to some country that I wasn't going to and that that didn't trigger a signal. So it almost seems like there's a way to incentivize consumers to get a little more engaged on their own loans and whatnot from a fraud perspective. So just a, just a yeah. thought. Yeah, no, 100%. I totally agree with uh, that. I think consumer participation in the fraud detection and prevention process is critical. I think going forward, I think we have to get consumers involved in protecting their accounts. By the way, that $50, having been in work with a lot of credit card banks and been an investigator myself, I've never heard of a bank actually charging that $50. Right. <laughs> so I think it's there as a... Uh, as something they could do, but nobody's ever right. done it. I think there is an element, I think there is a big element of first party fraud in the credit card disputes area. I know because mm -hmm. I used to be an investigator and what I found is about 40% of the claims that I got on a daily basis, if I called the customer, they either 
committed the transaction fraud themselves and they admitted it to me and dropped their claim or they knew it was somebody in their family. So I think the element of first party fraud is probably bigger than the negligence because it's a very simple process to get these yeah. charges removed. You touched on income. So maybe I'm just going to jump in there for a second. So when we think about employment and income verification, you know, Equifax as a work number was probably one of the first out in the market. But GDS, we've seen just an explosive growth from an employment standpoint. Yeah, permission solutions like Argyle and Pinwheel, non-permission solutions, uh, Experian and TransUnion have rolled out solutions recently. Then you have a company like Paralytics, which is a estimator based on Zip plus four. So I know that that point predictive offers some interesting solutions around employment and income. So maybe just kind of talk about what you guys have built. And and I know you have a whole database of fake employers and kind of how all that works. Yeah, it is interesting to see the focus on income and, and especially income automation. And I'm really happy to see it. I think the ecosystem has grown a lot. Tim and I, you know, our company is having looked at this problem for the last, I'd say, 15 years since we started looking at it in mortgage. We think here at Point Predictive, we found the solution that, that really works. And what we're doing is we have a product called Income Pass. It's basically, if I think about in the ecosystem and all the products you mentioned are fantastic, by the way, they all offer unique value. What we do, I think the way I describe the Income Pass is we can do an income validation in less than a second for a fraction of the price that you might have to pay for an expensive database check. So it's it's a lower cost solution that runs right up front. There's no borrower friction. So the borrower doesn't have to consent. They don't have to provide pay stubs. Those are always like those are always hurdles for the customer. Mm-hmm. There's none of that. What we do is we use our proprietary data and about eight different sources of data that we found have been really um, powerful in actually predicting how much a borrower should make or probably does make. These would be things like you know IRS data, census data, salary data, job postings on the internet. You think we kind of scour all these sources of data to try to pinpoint what we think a borrower should make. And we give a lender an indication in less than a second of whether the borrower is being truthful or not. And then they can kind of decide what they're going to do with Mm -hmm. that. Are they going to go out and request a pay stub? Are they going to go hit the work number? Are they going to hit the pinwheel, the plaid, and all those other solutions? It's a top of the waterfall check that gives them an instant response so they can decide, what do I do with this? Yeah, I think, too, you can combine that with, if you think about the Vantage or FICO score, right? So how do I look at stated income versus estimated income? And based on maybe that FICO score, Vanta score, some other custom score, other factors, that kind of becomes a decision tree of do I need to now do further income verification? So somebody maybe with a really high score and a slight deviation from the stated income versus someone with a bad score with that same deviation, do I need to do the same thing? You are so 100% correct on that. And I think a lot of banks, lenders, and companies miss the point that this is part of the, the risk. Here's something interesting. And our analysis shows that if a borrower misrepresent their income and you use that alone and you say, I'm not going to approve the loan because I think they misrepresented their income, that has zero predictability for default. Whether mm-hmm. you lie about your income alone, if you just lose that in isolation, you can't really predict default. However, when you combine it with like your, what you were talking about, your approach, if you look at somebody who has less than stellar credit, and they misrepresent their income by $10,000 and they're making, say, $40,000 a year, that is substantially different than a super prime borrower that misrepresented their income by the same amount. Mm -hmm. So it's all relative. And that's what makes income complex is you have to create that ecosystem and that good understanding of risk and apply that friction when it makes sense and take the friction off when it doesn't. And for our young listeners, what we're talking about here is one of the C's in credit, which is character, right? Am I telling the truth or not telling the truth? So there's still something that's around. So going back to auto for a second, your firm's getting ready to release your annual report, auto lending fraud trends. And thanks for letting me get a sneak peek. One section of the report stated that fraud experts at Point Predictive believe up to 1 million more fraudsters were activated in 2020 after stimulus programs were launched. After those stimulus programs ended, those same fraudsters shifted their efforts to steal cars through fraudulent financing of vehicles. And maybe this is something you touched on with the straw man problem, but maybe you could share some more highlights from the report that's getting ready to be released. Yeah, it's a pretty good report. We spent a lot of time on that. I, I personally spent probably 40 or 60 hours on just putting that together. What I found most insightful from the report, 
I didn't go into it expecting this, but we saw a 35% increase in identity theft last year. And it was already high. So what we're seeing is identity theft, at least in auto, is on this trajectory upwards. And it all ties back to COVID. The mm -hmm. people that were committing this PPP fraud and this EIDL fraud and this unemployment fraud, they learned how to commit sophisticated fraud, complex fraud. They learned how to buy data off the dark web and then apply mm -hmm. for loans. They just shifted their efforts to auto lending. In fact, we did our own analysis, and it's a part of this report as well, kind of a case study in there. We analyzed about 300 synthetic identities that occurred in Chicago. These are people that hit auto lenders, and the auto lenders lost you know, $67 million. Our research showed that 76% of those synthetic identities had taken out a PPP loan the prior year. Mm -hmm. So they were these fake identities that were used the year prior. So I think Synthetic identity, identity theft were primary drivers of that increase. We've seen just anecdotally, and you mentioned the dealer case that you read about in the paper, there are car dealers now in the United States that are getting three fraudsters a month walking in the dealership trying to steal cars. And these dealers had never seen a fraud before. I don't know what's going on, but these fraudsters are going after dealers right now. And they're going after lenders and they're using fake identities forged driver's licenses. It's crazy. I know one of the key strengths of your offering, and you mentioned it, is your proprietary data repository. And uh, in looking at your website, it talks about how you hold more than 120 million loan applications on more than 55 million unique applicants. And of course, it's growing every day. And it's interesting going back in time a little bit for you and I, I can remember when uh, I think it was Visa rolled out their issuer's clearinghouse for the credit card space where issuers had to report application data and it was all designed around capturing fraud. So it's, it's somewhat similar. Yeah. Can you share, you know, what are some of the key data assets I mentioned employment earlier that are found in the repository and perhaps speak to the process uh, you go through in taking that raw data and turning it into actionable intelligence? So you think about point predictive proprietary data. There's a lot of awesome data out there. Our data is completely different. So you think about like, the credit bureaus have a lot of great information on identities. Um, LexisNexis, all these companies provide a lot of value on the identity. What we do is we collect about 85 fields of information on every auto application, 125 fields of information on every mortgage application. On a personal loan, we may get about 10 to 15. A credit card, we may get seven to eight. But we basically collect this information at the consumer level. We got about 67 million unique consumers that we have in our data that we've seen anywhere from five to six to seven times. So mm -hmm. we see them multiple times. What makes the data unique is all these data points. There's like, we know what the borrowers reported as their income, their employment, what they purchased, what type of car was it? How much, what was the sales price? If it was a personal loan, what type of personal loan? What were they reporting as their income, their employer? We have this kind of cross-industry information and we tie back to the default. So every month the lenders tell us which loans they had fraud, which loans they had default, which loans charged off. And we're able to take each of those individual data points. Right now we're coming up on like 26 billion different data points we have in the database. And we tie it back to the fraud and the default. So you think about the massive amounts of data that we can then use and feed it into machine learning algorithms to mine all those patterns of fraud that might be hidden to the human eye, mm -hmm. but are intuitive, like Income is a great example. You know, when we see a borrower that's reported the same income for, you know, or close to the same income and in employment for four years, we know that there's very little risk of income fraud if we see that borrower again reporting the same information. However, we see somebody that's changing their income on every application by mm -hmm. 15, 20, 30,000, we know that that's a bad risk. Last year, we had one borrower we saw 120 times who had 120 different incomes and 18 different employers. So we know that that type of thing is very risky. So what we do is, I think ChatGPT is, is wonderful, by the way, because I think it's educating people on the power of AI. We apply a similar concept, but we do it for fraud, is we're just scouring massive amounts of data to try to find hidden fraud and, and make sense of fraud that's happening across these industries. So you mentioned as you're working with the, the lenders that are contributing you know, they tag, is it a fraud loss or is it a uh, mm -hmm. default loss? And, you know, when I talk to a lot of lenders around fraud solutions, mm -hmm. a problem that they raise sometimes is they may not be sure. 
they're not always sure whether it is a fraud loss or not. Does your, with your solution, do you have the ability to do like a retro study where a lender can report all their losses to you? Mm-hmm. And you can come back and say, well, really, the, these losses here were actually fraud and they became a first payment default, but you're classifying it as a payment default. It really wasn't, it was really a fraud issue. Yeah, this is the trickiest thing. We, we spend a lot of time doing this. We actually do two things. Actually, I say three things. We do a lot of aggregate analysis across the industry. So we do analysis through forensic reviews. We have our own fraud team that will go through applications and our reports and even use third-party sources to take all of the early payment default and first payment default for a lender, or at least a, a sample of them, and try to help them understand what's fraud and what's credit. And what we found on average is anywhere between 30 to 70% of those early payment defaults have some lie on the initial application. So somebody lied about their income, their employment, their identity. There's something that's untruthful. So it's a high degree of those early payment defaults. So what we do, we offer what we call a retrospective test where a lender can actually send us all the data and we're actually able to kind of identify for them how we perform and how the solution will help them solve both. Fraud they knew about, and fraud they didn't know about. And so we go through, it's called a retrospective test. We'll actually do a forensic review on a sample for them as well. We did this for a lender last week who said, you say 300 of these high scoring loans are fraud, uh, you know, which are fraud after review. We actually sent it to our fraud analyst and we gave them a number back. It wasn't 100%, but it was mm-hmm. around 50% of those early payment defaults that we said were fraud had fraud in them. So We try to help a lender navigate that fine and blurry line between fraud and credit. And it's it's not a simple black and white answer. Right, right. So you mentioned your fraud team and your website talks about not only artificial intelligence, but natural intelligence. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe elaborate more on what is your service around that natural intelligence piece? And how it comes yeah. into play. Yeah, just being a career anti-fraud professional, I felt like it was really important we had our own fraud team as a company. Mm-hmm. So we actually ended up hiring fraud analysts from the industry. These are experienced investigators that know how to find fraud. So we have a team of four fraud analysts. We have a team of three fraud consultants. Fraud analysts are kind of do loan level reviews and fraud consultants actually work with customers to help improve their strategies. But this team, we call our solution AI plus NI. AI is the artificial intelligence. NI is the natural intelligence. We think you need both. Natural intelligence, in all cases, feeds the artificial intelligence. That's how right. even chat GPT works, right? It's all of, the, all of the, the way they review the interactions online and the data that came in and what people wrote, and they can mimic that. So we use our fraud analysts to feed, classify fraud, to f- help the Data scientists fine-tune the model, reduce false positives. We think that natural intelligence and having the human aspect is so important in the as we develop AI solutions. If I was to hire you as a consultant mm. and I was working on my fraud strategy as a lender, and you kind of think about a checklist, what are some of the key points that you would want to determine as you were looking at our current processes what data sources we're using, what are the things that you'd really want to understand as you would help us craft the best yeah. fraud strategy for our type of business? This is my passion, is, uh, and I've done this. This is a, I was a fraud consultant for many years, and I worked on fraud strategy. We call it fraud situation analysis. I've done about 250 times. So I think about my process is, is kind of a structured process I would always follow. The first is, really just understanding your business. Like I'd always spend a little bit of time understanding a lender's or bank's business. But one of the gaps I find with a lot of banks and lenders is they don't take a loss-based approach to how they invest their money. They tend to have people want a certain tool, but they haven't looked at it in their overall picture. So the first thing I would do is look at, I'd sit down with a bank and say, where are your losses coming from? Where are your pain points? Where are you investing? And how do we fill those gaps? You have to Mm -hmm. take a loss-based approach Because improving your losses is how you get the ROI approved and how you get it prioritized with the executives and with the technology teams. So you have to start there. Look at where your losses are and then plug in the right solutions. So fill in the gaps. My other advice always to banks is create as many use cases with a single product as you can because you're going to have to go to finance to get the approval. 
So if you want a fraud tool, look at it as an impact to stop fraud, but then look at the other use cases in the organization. Can I use that fraud tool to reduce stipulations on the front end, to reduce friction, to auto-approve more? Because then I'm going to get somebody in sales and marketing and the product owner saying, hey, I've got a use case for this as well. And then mm -hmm. those benefits can be included in your ROI. So look at that complementary nature. And if you have other parts of the organization that can benefit, get those involved as well. And the last thing I'd, I'd say lenders and banks and finance companies really need to look at is how orthogonal the value is of that new solution. You don't want to mm -hmm. buy the same solution that gives you the same result because now you have two solutions to do the same thing. Look at the complementary nature of any solution that you're evaluating. And you'll oftentimes find that, I hate to say this because it sounds so cliche, but one plus one can equal three. We've actually done analysis with our score and another lender score. And we've actually found the other lender score and our score makes our score better and their score better. And it gives them a almost a doubling effect because they can come out from two different angles. That's how I would kind of at a high level recommend to a lender is just kind of looking at that kind of four-step process of what's my losses, where are my gaps, what's the orthogonal value, and how do I get other parts of the business in that business case. So you mentioned the use of you know multiple sources, right? There may not be one solution that fits all the problems. Do you recommend A, B testing? So where I may take a percent of my applications and say, hey, I'm going to actually introduce a new solution provider, and let's say a point predictive. They're not currently using you, but they want to do some testing. Maybe it's easier to do it on a forward flow basis. So as part of your consulting, would you recommend to your clients that they do some level of champion challenge or A-B testing as part of the evaluations process? There's two routes you can go. One is the retrospective to pilot to full production. And that's kind of the way I look at that is like you do a, a back test of old loans. And then when you're satisfied that you're going to get a use case, you can run a pilot program, which is like, like you said, it's either let's run 10% or let's run 100% for a period of time and look at the results. You can do it that way. And there's a variety of ways. I think it depends on the lender's urgency. So one of the benefits to a the approach you, you mentioned, which is like an A-B test, is you can be very methodical and you can be very careful and you can see the value on a small percent. However, if you have a fraud problem, the cost of like an A-B test can be substantial, right? Because you're losing right. fraud on the other 90%. It's a case-by-case -case basis. It's wonderful to have a, that A-B testing component, but for every lender, it may be different. They may want to mm -hmm. go with a retro approach. They may want to go with a pilot approach or maybe an A-B AB approach. So having those kind of different options is always, always a plus. Yeah, and then having the flexible technology like we offer GDS to easily be able to accommodate all those different use cases obviously yeah. becomes critical. But also, you know, you're not all fraud solution providers like Point Predictive can actually support retro, right? Mm. Some of them really only can support a forward flow analysis sure. because of their structure, maybe how they're buying data or what whatnot. So you guys yeah. are a little unique there. So I was reading one of your uh, blogs this weekend and I came across something that I really need you to explain to me because it was kind of getting me to scratch my head a little bit. And you talked about zombie debt reassignment, boost synthetic identities. And uh, you know, for our audience, can you explain what, what is zombie debt reassignment and how are fraudsters taking advantage of it? Yeah, I don't blame you. It's a head scratcher. It actually took me a good day or two to figure out what I was seeing online. So it started off, I started, I'm always researching fraud trends. And I started to see this term zombie debt reassignment appear on YouTube, on Telegram, on the dark web. And I was like, what the heck is this? And I learned, and I'll give you the summary very quickly, zombie debt is debt that's charged off a, a consumer's credit. It's uncollectible. It's usually three to 10 years old. You can go on sites like Debt Catcher, which are kind of these bad debt sites. You can buy these debts for pennies on the dollar. So some, like you can buy a mortgage that charged off 10 years ago, that's to another consumer. Yeah. Then you own that debt, presumably for the rights to collect on that debt, although you can't. But what you can do, apparently, is you can send a letter to the original creditor saying, you need to report this correctly. I assume this debt. My name is Frank McKenna. I paid it in full, reported to the credit bureau that that mortgage for $100,000 has been paid in full by me satisfactorily. 
That means it goes on my credit report. Having a mortgage that's paid off makes my credit score go up and I look like a good credit risk. That is zombie debt reassignment, turning charged off bad debt into a better credit score. And it blows my mind that you can do this, but apparently you can. I see it all over the internet now. Well, this is a good segue into one of the final things we'll talk about. And you mentioned this in your blog, and I think we all know that the fight against fraud and the perpetration of fraud is clearly a cat and mouse game. Fraudsters develop new techniques. The industry find ways to combat those new techniques. And then the fraudsters develop new, new techniques or approaches. Mm -hmm. And my question is, with fraudsters demonstrating such a strong skill at adapting, what do you feel it will take to really win this war? Because we are at war. I think you nailed it, Rich. Earlier in our conversation, you talked about consumers participating in the fraud detection and prevention. That, to me, consumers and banks working together is the way forward. The ability for a consumer to freeze their credit, by the way, is one way. The ability for a consumer to turn their debit card on and off. The ability for a consumer to proactively notify a bank when they're going out of country. All of that, all those things we can think of are going to help us win the war. Because right now, banks are trying to do it independently without understanding what the consumer is going through. Technology is getting to the point where you can easily interact with a consumer via text or platforms or applications. Mm -hmm. That's the way to go. I think that is going to be key. I think banks are going to have to work to speed up the process of integrating new technologies because they are far slower than the fraudsters. And if you mm -hmm. go on now with Telegram, with Dark Web, there are 100,000 Telegram channels dedicated to fraud and fraudsters talking to each other in real time, minute to minute. Banks don't have the luxury of that. But we're going to have to find a way for banks to get more comfortable integrating new and upcoming technologies and talk to each other. Because if they're talking that quickly and the banks aren't collaborating in the same way, we won't win the war. I think the combination of banks working together with consumers and then banks getting quicker, working with law enforcement and working with social media, all of that's going to be key to winning the war. And the aging population, right, is mm -hmm. educating. I'm very blessed. I have a 93-year-old and a... 88 year old mother and 93 year old father. And uh, I'm proud to say that I get calls for them now saying, Hey, I just got this thing pop up on my iPhone. Is it legitimate? Right. Wow. And I've trained them at that age to detect these things. And I'll say, Mom and Dad, if you're calling me and you're asking me, it's not legitimate. <laughs> so just yes, delete you're it. Right. Right. You are correct. Yeah. And uh, if you remember a uh, gentleman that was uh, at Credco, First Advantage started a company. Uh, really around helping elders avoid being victims of fraud. And open banking is a way to, I think, get at that as children, right? If we get on our parents' accounts and yeah. we can see, hey, hey, dad, why are you writing these checks for $500? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Right. And that's the way to do it. So we're getting near the hour. So I'm going to throw out one more personal question and then we'll, we'll sign off and learning a little more about your background. Uh, I understand that you come from a very large family. I believe you are one of 12 children. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. 12. Okay. Can you share some key lessons you learned from growing up with so many siblings? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think growing up with so many siblings, the first thing I learned is really sharing and mm -hmm. about participating with each other. I was shocked when I went to college, by the way, and we would stock the refrigerator with stuff. I'd go to the store and I'd put whatever in there. And if I always expected people would just take it, but and the vice versa, people would never, like if I went in and took some milk, they'd be like, hey, you took my milk. To me, that was the biggest shock was that things don't belong to everybody. Because when you're <laughs> growing up in a big family, everybody just shares everything. I think that whole concept of just sharing and going, realizing that you can help other people was something I really learned. And I also learned that having a big family, like you said, with your parents, you have such a support network. Now I'm just so grateful. And I think your family is very important in protecting you, by the way, from like fraud yeah. and scams. I mean, my father, unfortunately, was a victim of elder abuse and $169,000 fraud. And uh, I didn't find out about it until, until it was too late. Uh, I wished I'd, you know, he'd reached out to me early in the process like your parents do. So I think that network is, family network is just critical. And I just remember the name of the company was uh, it's Eversafe, the company oh, that was uh, nice. started by Howard Tischler. So for people listening, it's uh, it's definitely something that you should look at for your elder parents. 
And, uh, you know, it's funny, I say to my daughter, you talk about that your friends and family, and maybe this is negative, but I say, you know, in your life, if you have five really, really good friends that go. would be there for you at the drop of a hat, you're a very wealthy person. You're a very wealthy person. Yeah, that's right. As you get a little older, you start to realize that you have that core group. You start to know who those five are. I think when yeah. you're in college and in your 20s and 30s, you have 70, 80, 90 <laughs> friends. And then it comes down to you got three and yeah. you got your family and you're happy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, Frank, thank you so much for joining us today. This is Rich Alterman, and we've been syncing up with Frank McKenna, Chief Strategist and Co-Founder of Point Predictive. If you would like to learn more about Frank's firm, please visit pointpredictive.com or email the experts at info at pointpredictive.com with any questions you have. And I really do recommend for those people listening today or tomorrow that you do go and sign up for frankonfraud.com, which is Frank's blog, and stay abreast of what's going on. Thanks for tuning in today and learning more about fraud trends and fraud prevention in the lending industry. We look forward to having you join us in future podcasts. Make it a great week. And this is Rich Altman signing off. For those seeking to improve their decisioning and lending processes, don't miss a chance to connect with GDS Link and Point Predictive at FinTech Nexus, taking place in New York City on May 10th and 11th. And please stop by GDS Link's booth number 742 to meet with our team of solution specialists and learn how GDS Link's cutting edge decision solutions can help accelerate your organization's growth. And please be sure to connect with Point Predictive Tom Algi and Jeff Hendren to learn how they are leading the fight against emerging fraud threats. Additional event details can be found in the show notes. Please take advantage of this opportunity to connect with industry leaders and take your lending to new heights. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to leave us a review. Follow us on LinkedIn and connect with us on Twitter at GDS Link. That's at G-D-S-L-I-N-K. Have a question for the show or have a specific topic you want us to cover? Hit the link in the description to drop us a note. Thank you for lending us part of your day. Make it a great one.